Uh, lots more details, uh, data, software, all the primary papers are here because I'm only going to have a chance to kind of give a, a broad um, overview today. Uh, what I'd like to talk about are three main points here. First of all, I'm going to focus on the competencies of navigating unconventional spaces. So this goes beyond the three-dimensional kind of uh, problem solvings uh, that uh, conventional um, brainy systems do. And then I will talk about a particular example of this unconventional intelligence which is basically uh, the, the idea of non-neural cells using familiar uh, electrical communication pathways as a kind of cognitive glue to give them the ability to uh, uh, solve problems in anatomical space. And I will talk about uh, specific applications of this idea to show that this is not just uh, philosophy or, or wordplay, but it actually leads to some uh, very interesting biomedical approaches. Uh, I'll talk about uh, briefly about cancer as literally a dissociative identity disorder of the somatic um, intelligence. And then at the very end, I'm going to talk about uh, some, some novel embodiments and uh, mention a little bit about the ethics of diverse intelligence. And uh, our approach is to uh, study experimentally the collective intelligence of groups of cells that navigate anatomical space. And this allows us to think about uh, broadly the field of diverse intelligence and what do minds in unfamiliar embodiments look like. And uh, really to try to, um, to fill the, the gamut from, from very fundamental philosophical ideas that have been kicked around for a very long time to uh, how some of these things can become actionable therapeutics. So. One, one place that, that we might start is with, with this, kind of, uh, this kind of old image. Uh, this is uh, Adam uh, naming the animals in the Garden of Eden. And of course, uh, there are two things here that are, that are important. One is that uh, there are a set of discrete natural kinds that are meant to be uh, individual uh, specific, um, specific kinds of uh, uh, agents. And then here's Adam, and he's, of course, different from the others. And uh, one of his roles is to name the other animals. And this, as you'll see in the end of the talk, this is very profound because naming something is in a sense to discover its true nature. And it's going to be on us to discover the true nature of some very unconventional uh, beings that they have never been here before in the tree of life. And that is because uh, this, this, this human with their um, kind of agential glow that uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people focus on as, as kind of a, a special thing, um, we are at the center of continua, not only uh, on the evolutionary timescale, but also the developmental timescale. And so when we talk about hum humans doing this or that, we have to ask which, which kind of human and what, you know, where, where does that happen? And now with uh, uh, synthetic biology and, uh, and bioengineering, we now know that there's another continuum here, which is that through both uh, engineering and um, enge engineered uh, components and biological modifications, we can make some very unusual hybrids and, uh, and things like that, that again, ask us to, uh, to, to try to develop tools to understand what is the cognitive world of beings that are really quite different from, from what we're used to. And that's because life is very interoperable. And at every level of the hierarchy, we can introduce uh, uh, engineered uh, components and make something that has never existed before. So what I'm very interested in, and this is that, that paper that Lars was, was mentioning, was, was kind of the first uh, um, explication of, of what I'm trying to do, which is to develop a framework where we can think about all sorts of agents now. So this includes the familiar kinds of things, uh, you know, apes and birds and maybe a whale and octopus and insects and so on. And then uh, colonial organisms and swarms and engineered new life forms and uh, AIs, whether purely software or embodied robotics, potentially exobiological agents at some point, so, so some kind of alien life. How do we think about all these things? What do they all have in common? And uh, obviously, I'm not the first person to think about this. So here's uh, Rosenbluth, Wiener, and Bigelow's uh, kind of scale from the 1940s. And this is a cybernetic view, which, which specifically goes from, from passive matter all the way up through various uh, categories or phase transitions, if you will, uh, that uh, allow novel kinds of uh, uh, functionality and, uh, and, and behavior to arise, but at the same time recognizing that this is in fact a continuum, that, that, that these are not categorically uh, d different things, but that actually you have to ask where things land on this continuum. And so for me, uh, to make this very practical, uh, I like an engineering approach, which is to say that 
um, cognitive claims about uh, anything, whether whether you know an animal or or anything else, uh, any kind of cognitive claim is really a pro an engineering protocol claim. So what you're really saying, I think, when you say that this is a system that is 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 cognitive at a particular level, is what you're really saying is what kind of tools can we deploy to interact with it in an optimal way. And so here are just four um, very basic uh, examples. So systems like this or so simple machines, your, your only tool in your toolkit is hardware modification. You're not going to convince it of anything. You're not going to train it. Uh, this is, you know, this is all, all you can do is modify the hardware. And then we progressively move up to various kinds of cybernetic circuits where you can do more interesting things like reset their set point and let them uh, do what they do best, which is, which is uh, try to, um, maintain it. And then of course you have other kinds of systems that you can do rewards and punishments and training and then human level metacognition and whatever is beyond that. So um, one of the critical things I think in this, in this uh, field is that we can't just have philosophical feelings about where things land on the spectrum. We have to do experiments. So when we ask where do cellular collectives fit on this kind of uh, spectrum, this, I, I call it an axis of persuadability specifically because from the perspective of an engineer, the question is, how do we get the system to do something that it wasn't doing before? So that is that is how we, um, we, we make this practical, these ideas very practical. And so, so this question of where do cellular collectives fit? I mean, most people uh, in our field will, will, will say that, that it's, they're down here and people say things all the time like, well, it's a chemical machine. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't have a brain and it, uh, you know, it can't do this or that. Uh, we have to do experiments. We can't just assume. And um, part, of, part of it is that we all started life as a single cell. So a little blob of chemistry and physics that uh, becomes one of these things, or even perhaps uh, something like this. And the one thing we learn for sure from developmental biology is that there is no sharp dividing line that turns physics and chemistry into mind. Okay, you're not going to find any specific stage at which suddenly um, things tick over. So we know that what we're really looking for in the science is some kind of a, a, a principled um, set of models about the scaling of whatever competencies uh, these things can do up to what, what happens here. How, how does this, uh, how do they arise both evolutionarily and developmentally? Um, and, then, and then there's the issue that, uh, so, so, so people often see this and they say, okay, fine. So, so we somehow develop from a single cell but at least we're a unified mind. We're a unified intelligence. We're not like a collection of um, ants or termites where people say that these are uh, uh, collective intelligence, but, but it's really, you know, it's, it's not the same. We, we, are an actually, we are actually a unified mind. Well, the thing, the thing to keep in, in, in mind, of course, is that um, even something like the pineal gland, which Descartes thought was really fitting for, uh, for, for humans who have this uh, supposedly unified um, perspective, is that if he had had good microscopy, he would have known that inside that pineal gland, there are uh, huge numbers of individual cells. And inside of each of those cells is all of this stuff. This is the molecular machinery in there. So in an important sense, we are all collective intelligences. We are all made of parts. Uh, our parts look like this. So this is, uh, now, now this is, happens to be a free living organism, but you can see what's going on here at the level of a single cell. So this, this uh, little creature is in, incredibly competent with its physiological needs, its uh, metabolic uh, and so on. Uh, all of that uh, being handled, no brain, no nervous system. Um, this, is, this is what it can do about the goals of its tiny little, uh, little world. And so um, again, what I'm interested in is the scaling. I want to know how these competencies, and this, this of course is a chemical, uh, chemical system, these guys can learn. Um, if we don't think that you can reward or punish a chemical network, that's pretty much what you have here is a set of, uh, is a set of these uh, physical and chemical processes. And so I'm also really interested in this notion of a cognitive glue. So if you have this rat that learns to press a lever and get a reward, the cells at the bottom of the foot are the ones that experience the lever. The cells in the gut experience the sugar. Uh, who is it that owns the associative memory that these things are connected? No individual cell had both experiences. There has to be a rat that is uh, in some way uh, the owner of information that none of its parts have. And um, we're interested in how the problem solving capacities of these collectives relate to those of their parts. Um, and, and so we're, we're, we also notice that uh, the, uh, the architecture of, of, of life is very multi-scale, not just structurally, but actually each level here of this, of this hierarchy is itself a competent various problem spaces. So they solve all kinds of uh, issues in physiological, anatomical, and other kinds of spaces. So these are the kinds of models we make of multi-scale agents 
uh, that cooperate and, uh, and and compete for for for, for various things and, and what happens. Now, um, we are reasonably good at uh, noticing intelligence of medium-sized um, objects moving at medium speeds through three-dimensional space. We're used to, and even and even there, when we, you know it's it's really hard for people to 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 uh, buy the concept of intelligence in unfamiliar um, kinds of uh, kinds of animals, but. But, you know, this, this navigating three-dimensional space is what people are used to. But I think it's really important to understand that while we, uh, because of our sensory apparatus and our lifestyle, are very um, preoccupied with specific scales of space and time, and also with three-dimensional space, there are other spaces in which other types of agents live. They, they operate in those spaces, they solve problems, they uh, uh, pr perform a perception action loop, they have goals that they meet with some level of, uh, of, of, of competency. And these include spaces of gene expression, um, spaces of physiological state and anatomical morphospace. Now I could tell you some amazing stories about cells navigating and solving problems in these spaces, but I won't have time to do that today. Um, so I'm going to focus on anatomical morphospace. I will just uh, just mention one quick thing, which is that even uh, small pathways, so groups of uh, let's say 10 uh, or so uh, genes that can turn each other on and off, already uh, demonstrate the dynamics of six different kinds of memory, including Pavlovian conditioning. So you do not need the rest of the cell. You certainly don't need neurons to do um, some things that are uh, really well described by uh, paradigms in behavior science, and you can you can see those here. But so so already, and and this is a, a biomedical research program that we have taking advantage of the learning capacities of the pathways of your body to use drugs in a very different way than is used now. But uh, but let's talk about um, the, the anatomical morphous space. So I find it really interesting that um, Alan Turing, who obviously uh, was the forefather of um, a lot of ideas in artificial intelligence, he thought about computation. He thought about minds embodied in uh, different uh, different types of media, and specifically reprogrammability. This issue of problem-solving machines and intelligence through plasticity, and what does it what does it mean to program or reprogram a a, a machine? Um, but what he also did, uh, interestingly enough, is publish a paper called The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis. This was uh, an extremely early uh, uh, attempt to understand how do uh, embryos self-organize and why is it that, uh, that order arises in embryogenesis. And so you might, you might ask, well, why would somebody who's interested in, in, in cognition and, uh, and computation and things like that suddenly be writing papers about uh, the, the biochemistry of early, early development? And I think that uh, even though as far as I know, he didn't write anything about this, I think he saw a very profound um, symmetry, a very profound a commonality between the problem of the origin of the mind and the origin of the body. And I think he was right on. I think, I think there's some very deep um, analogies here that we'll explore a little bit today. So where do anatomies come from? Well, we all start life uh, like this uh, as, uh, as a set of uh, embryonic blastomeres. Uh, eventually, this is a cross section through the human torso. Look at the incredible order here, right? All of these complex parts, everything is in the right place in the right, uh, you know, orientation relative to next to the next to the right neighbor and so on. Uh, where does this pattern actually come from? Now, you might be tempted to say DNA. Most people at this point say genome, it's in the DNA. But of course, we can read genomes now. And we know that the spatial structure is not explicitly in the genome at all, any more than the shape of this a um, uh, uh, termite mound or the shape of the spider web is in the genome of these of these creatures. It's an emergent uh, feature of the of the physiology and the behavior of these cells. So we need to understand how do the cells with the hardware that the genome does encode. And so the genome obviously encodes the the the, the tiny protein hardware that every cell gets to have. So so the 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 functional software that then uh, describes the behavior of these cells. How do they know what to build? How do they know when to stop? As, as, as engineers, we might also ask, um, how far can we push this process? And so, so my lab actually does a lot of work on synthetic morphology. I'll show you a tiny bit at the end, but it's quite remarkable what cells with a perfectly normal genome can be um, convinced to build. Um, and as workers in regenerative medicine, we'd like to know how do we repair? If something is missing or damaged, how do we convince the cells to build some, something else? And if we think about what um, the, the end game of that, of that field, I think it is the anatomical compiler. So someday we'll be able to sit down in front of a computer, draw the plant, animal, organ, or biobot that you want. And what the computer will do is uh, compile this description down into a set of stimuli 
that would have to be given to these cells to, to, to have them build exactly what you just drew. Okay, so complete control over growth and form. Now, this is a very practical concern, of course, because uh, all of these things, birth defects, um, you know, failure to regenerate after injury, cancer, aging, all of this would go away if we knew how to convince a group of cells to build something uh, very specific, whatever it is that we wanted. And um, keep in mind, this is not meant to be a 3D printer. This is not about micromanaging the cells. This is about uh, uh, translating. It's basically a communications device to translate our anatomical goals into those of the cellular collective. Now, despite uh, the, the, oops, uh, the importance of this thing, we don't have anything like this yet. And why not? I mean, molecular biology and, and, and genetics and biochemistry have been going gangbusters for, for, for decades. Why don't we have this? Well, the, well I, I think that what's happening here is that while we're very good at manipulating uh, molecular, mo molecules, um, we're really a very long way away from controlling large scale form and function. Biomedicine today is all about uh, uh, digging into the molecular level hardware. So genomic editing, uh, pathway uh, rewiring, protein engineering, all of these things are about the hardware. And if you think about the kind of trajectory that computer science took, this is what programming looked like in the, in the 1940s and 50s. So you literally, to program, you had to, uh, you had to manipulate the system at the level of the hardware. You had to rewire it. But then what happened is, and the reason you don't use your um, uh, soldering iron on your laptop when you go from Microsoft Word to Photoshop, is that uh, they've understood that certain kinds of media are uh, strongly reprogrammable, that you, we can take advantage of their competencies with software level interventions, and that we can use various abstractions to understand how they process information. It's not all about the hardware. So I think what we're missing in biomedicine and what I'm going to talk about today is uh, this, this frontier, which is, which is addressing the, uh, the intelligence layers that I think exist in the biological hardware. Now, when I say intelligence, what do I mean? Um, I'm going to restrict it to, to, I mean, obviously there are many components to this and many people have other definitions. Uh, I'm just going to focus on this one way of thinking about it, which is kind of William James's idea, which is that it's the ability to reach the same goal by various means. So that means uh, that uh, we're not asking uh, what kind of brain it has. We're not asking what it's made of. The very sort of cybernetic definition that basically focuses on whatever the goals of the system are, how competent or clever is it in meeting those goals when new things happen? And this means that you can't just infer this from observation. You can't watch cells doing things and say, oh, look, you know, they're, they're intelligent. You have, to add, you have to formulate very specific hypotheses. What space do you think they're working in? What goals do you think they have? What, what competencies do you think they have to meet those goals? And then you, then you do the experiment. You, may, you put barriers and, and so on. So, so he illustrates, James illustrates this in the following example. When you have two magnets trying to come together, uh, this process is a very, very low IQ kind of scenario because what the magnet will never do is move further from its goal temporarily going around the barrier to get to where it's going. Okay, it has no ability for delayed gratification. It's just never going to do that. In contrast, in his example, Romeo and Juliet, have, um, they have long-term planning and they have all kinds of abilities to, uh, to, to get further from their goal temporarily to overcome various physical and social barriers. In between, you have all kinds of other systems. So you have cells that navigate mazes and you have autonomous vehicles and various kinds of animals and so on. And so, so this is, this is uh, the empirical side of this is we have to make a hypothesis and we have to test specifically what competencies do they have. So now let's, let's get to it. What kind of collective intelligence do cellular swarms deploy? What do I mean when I say um, intelligence in other spaces? Well, let's consider this, this notion of navigating anatomical morphospace. space. Um, development uh, starts like this and ends up like this. And so if you think about the space of all possible anatomical configurations, what you have here is a long journey uh, to a very uh, specific ensemble of states that corresponds to the normal human target morphology. And the first thing we know is that this is very reliable. Now that by itself is not, not a sign of intelligence because an open loop process that was reliable and always resulted in, let's say an increase in complexity and the same kind of outcome, that by itself is, uh, can, be, can be just a, a, you know, a, a very mechanical kind of thing. But um, one thing we know about embryos is that they are uh, incredibly uh, resilient to all kinds of uh, perturbations. So for example, if you cut these uh, embryos into pieces, you don't get half bodies, but you get our normal monozygotic twins, triplets, and so on. And so this navigation of anatomical space, they can get there from different starting positions. They can uh, often avoid um, local maxima. Um, I have many examples that, uh, you know, we could, we could talk for hours about how they do this, but, um, uh, 
you can you can see what happens in in animals that retain this ability throughout their lifetime, like this axolotl. Uh, here it's got this this limb, and you can amputate the limb anywhere you want. And what they'll do is they'll grow exactly the right amount. They'll they'll do the complex patterning, lots of cell proliferation, and then they stop. That's the most amazing thing about regeneration is that it knows when to stop. When does it stop? It stops when a correct salamander arm has been completed. And these guys can regenerate their eyes, their jaws, their tails, um, uh, ovaries, and, and so on. And so what you have here is the ability to get to the same uh, outcome from different starting positions, uh, despite uh, various kinds of uh, various kinds of injury and so on. By the way, humans and other mammals can do this a little bit. So we regenerate our livers. Deer regenerate antlers at the rate of a centimeter and a half of new bone per day. So like really remarkable. This is an, an adult uh, mammal doing this. So this is just to say that what I'm going to show you isn't about just about frogs and worms, because that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, and even human children can regenerate their, their fingertips. So, so this ability to uh, get to the correct target morphology when you've been deviated from it by injury is not the end of the story. There is an even deeper um, kind of thing, which this is one of my favorite examples. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a cross-section through a kidney tubule um, in, a, in a newt. And what you'll notice is uh, usually about eight to 10 cells that work together to give you, that, uh, give you this anatomical structure. Now, uh, the ability to get to where you're going in anatomical space, as I said, is not just about external injury. Uh, one thing that uh, we can do uh, is increase the, the amount of genetic material in the early cell. So this is, um, this is a process that can be done with the egg where the cell, uh, the, the DNA divides, but the cell does not. And so what you end up with is very large cells. So you can make polyploid newts this way, you know, so, so 2N, 4N, 6N, and so on. When you do this, what you find is that uh, the cells become much larger, but the, but the whole newt stays the same size. So the system automatically scales the number of cells needed to complete this, uh, this process to the new cell number. So amazing thing number one, things work perfectly well, even though you have multiple copies of your genome floating around, so that doesn't confuse it. Uh, amazing thing number two, when you're working with uh, cells that are now abnormally large in size, no problem, we know what to do. We can use fewer of them to build the same thing. And then amazing thing number three, which is that when you make the cells truly gigantic, one single cell will wrap around itself, uh, giving you the same structure. Now, what's remarkable about that is that this is a different molecular mechanism. This is cell-to-cell -cell communication. This is cytoskeletal bending. So this system in the pursuit of this particular anatomical outcome can choose different molecular uh, tools in the, in the toolkit available to these cells to get the job done. Think about what this means for a salamander um, entering this, this, this world for the first time. You can't count on having the right amount of DNA. You can't count on having the right size cells. You can't count on um, having uh, the right number of cells. That's a different set of experiments I haven't told you about. Um, and you still need to uh, to, to complete your journey through that morphous space using whatever tools you have available. This is not injury. This is not something that normally happens to these animals. This is not the typical kind of regeneration, but it is a response to a, to a kind of injury at a larger scale, which is evolutionary change, so mutation. So for this reason, and we could talk more about this, um, I think that one thing that evolution really does is make problem-solving agents. I don't think it makes solutions to specific environments because it commits from the very beginning to the fact that everything is going to change and you cannot overtrain on the priors of past generations. So this kind of problem-solving capacity is everywhere. Um, here's one simple example that, um, that we found just to kind of nail down um, this, this experiment, uh, this, this, uh, this, this point. Um, these are tadpoles of the frog, Xenopus lavis. Here are the eyes, here's the brain, here are the nostrils, the mouth. So typically what happens is that these tadpoles have to become a frog. And in order to do that, they have to rearrange their face. So they have to move all these craniofacial components. Now you could, and people did think uh, up until we found this a few years ago, um, that this was a hardwired process. After all, every tadpole looks the same and every frog looks the same. So all you need to do is move all these components in the right distance, a fixed amount, and you're good. So we decided to test that, uh, that uh, claim and find out like how much uh, actual uh, problem solving capacity there is here. So we made Picasso, what we call Picasso tadpoles. So these are tadpoles where all the craniofacial organs are scrambled. So here's the eyes on top of the head, the mouth is off to the side, everything is scrambled. And uh, the amazing thing is that they become pretty normal frogs because all of these components will move through novel, uh, unconventional paths 
to get to where they need to go and then they stop. Now, sometimes they go a little bit too far actually and they have to, they have to come back a little bit, but eventually they stop. So what the genetics actually gives us is uh, not a set of uh, hardwired uh, rearrangements, but actually a system of error minimization. It's a, it's a system that functionally uh, has a particular set point in, it, in effect measures error towards that set point and will keep changing until that error is uh, within uh, acceptable tolerances. So that raises a clear question. Uh, how does it know when it's reached the right thing? What is, I mean, this, this whole thing is a, a, a process of anatomical homeostasis as people study in physiological homeostasis and so on. So the question is, uh, if, you have a, if you have a homeostatic system like this, where's the set point? Okay, homeostatic processes need to store a set point. Where is the set point? So we took a lot of inspiration from um, neuroscience, and uh, I don't I don't have to belabor it for this group. Uh, the the idea that neural decoding is this uh, um, commitment to the idea that that the the memories, preferences, goals, behavioral repertoires of a, of a system, it can be read out from the electrophysiology of their brain. So if we understood how to decode these patterns, we would know. So this is a living zebrafish brain that this, uh, this group imaged. Um, if we knew how to decode these patterns, we could understand the, uh, the, the, the behavior and the mental life of, of this creature. So this is an amazing system that uh, uses... Um, electrical communication between cells to process information in the service of uh, behavior and, 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 and spe specifically goal-directed behavior that, the, that animals can do. Well, it turns out that evolution discovered the utility of electrical networks for this process very early on. This is not something that um, nerves or brains invented. This is basically as old as the, uh, the first bacterial biofilms. So every cell in your body has these ion channels. Most of the cells have electrical synapses known as gap junctions uh, between them. And uh, what we embarked uh, years ago, what we embarked on was a very parallel um, path uh, to, to that in neuroscience is to say, okay, uh, can we use all of the tools that have been developed? And this means uh, importing uh, uh, practical tools, things like optogenetics, um, uh, uh, drugs that uh, hit the uh, neurotransmitter pathways and so on, uh, and the conceptual tools, you know, all this stuff from, from behavioral science, all of the, uh, you know, active inference and all, all, these, all these kinds of things. We, we, we steal everything from, from neuroscience because the tools do not distinguish. As far as the tools are concerned, this is the same kind of process. And that's an important clue. The fact that, that the tools don't distinguish this uh, asks us to, to, to um, really think hard about um, why we distinguish this. Uh, because it turns out that uh, most things that neurons do every cell in the body can do, but on a different time scale. So they work on a much slower time scale. And I, I think that what evolution did was pivot this system um, towards uh, a mode to, the, the system of controlling your journey through anatomical space became pivoted into controlling your motion into th in three-dimensional space when nerves and muscles came on the scene. So um, we wanted to ask a simple question. Um, uh, what does the body think about? We, we, we know some of the things that brains think about. What does the body think about? What are these electrical networks doing as they, uh, as, prior to the formation of the, of the brain? So we developed some of the first tools to read and write um, this electrical information from non-neural cells, the way that the people have been doing in, uh, in the nervous system. So this, for example, is a, a, a time-lapse video using a voltage-sensitive fluorescent dye of the early steps of frog embryo development. So what you're watching here is all of the uh, conversations that these cells are having with each other in this network around uh, who's going to be left, right, top, bottom, and so on. Um, and the question is, can we learn to read and decode this information? So we do a lot of uh, quantitative simulation where we start with knowing what ion channels are expressed and we have these pathways, but then we simulate the electrical uh, paths the way that people do with neural network simulators and ask how do they do things like pattern completion, error correction, uh, and some other things I'm gonna show you taken right out of um, the typical um, neuroscience. And I wanna show you a quick example of, uh, of, of what these, um, what these uh, patterns look like. So this is a time-lapse of a frog embryo putting its face together. Here's one particular pattern. And uh, the reason I'm showing you this pattern, it's, a, it's the easiest one to decode, the easiest one we found so far. Uh, we call it the electric face because it basically looks like a face. Uh, by looking at the electrical pattern in these tissues, you know what the future gene expression and anatomy is going to be. Here's where the animal's right eye is going to be formed. Here are the placodes, here's the mouth. And we know, as I'll show you momentarily, if you manipulate this pattern, the cells build something different. 
And there's also, so that's, so that's an endogenous pattern that is required for normal craniofacial development. This is a pathological pattern that we induce by injecting oncogenes. And, and I'll tell you the story of cancer um, shortly. So uh, watching patterns is all well and good, but the most important thing is of course, a functional perturbation so that we can see if we can, can we really read and write new information into these electrical uh, networks? The, remember the, the hypothesis is that, that, that these electrical networks, much like in the brain, are literally the, the medium, the information processing medium of the uh, collective intelligence that solves anatomical problems. Much like in the brain, the networks underlie the collective behavior of neurons that solve other kinds of uh, problems. So, so can we learn to read and write this information? So we don't use any applied electric fields. There are no waves, there are no frequencies, there are no electrodes, no magnets, nothing like that. Uh, we do exactly what neuroscientists do, which is that we target uh, either the topology of the network by opening and closing specific gap junctions, or we can target the actual electrical state of these cells by controlling the ion channels. So we're talking about drug-based um, openers and blockers, uh, uh, genetic mutation of channels, um, optogenetics, and so on. And what we're doing is taking advantage of the, um, the, the interface, the electrical interface by which cells normally control each other's behavior. So all, everything I'm going to show you works in in morphogenesis, not because we're, we're so smart and we engineered all this stuff, it works because that is how the cells normally control each other. This is very much an endogenous native, uh, taking advantage of an endogenous native system. So um, well, having seen that, that, that spot in the, uh, in the electric face that makes an eye, you might wonder, what happens if we introduce that somewhere else? So this idea that, that, that these patterns are basically memories, they're basically spatial memories of the set point that guides morphogenesis, uh, that makes a strong prediction. We should be able to uh, reproduce them somewhere else. So, so okay, so we can inject a, a, a set of ion channel RNAs into a particular region to establish the voltage pattern that we want. That voltage pattern will tell the local cells, you should build an eye. And here you go, you can make an eye um, anywhere uh, in the animal, including out of gut cells. Um, if you section these eyes, they can have all the right lens, uh, retina, optic nerve, they can have all the right stuff inside. Now, notice, notice a few interesting things. First thing you learn from this is that, uh, in fact, these bioelectrical patterns are instructive. If you, can, if you control the pattern and put it somewhere else, you can make large-scale changes, coherent large-scale changes in the, in the anatomy, meaning you can control um, whole behavioral modules in that uh, anatomical um, kind of agent. That's the first thing. The second thing is it's very modular. So what we have here is a stimulus, a prompt, that causes a very complex downstream set of behaviors we didn't have to micromanage the stem cells or tell any of the genes when to come on. It's very, a uh, very top-down trigger. It's a stimulus that causes the system to exert a whole bunch of uh, little um, uh, journeys in the anatomical space that are required to make this eye. The third thing is that um, in your developmental biology textbook, you would see that uh, only the anterior neurectoderm, this stuff up here, is supposedly competent to make eye. Now, that's because uh, typically what they do is they, uh, they prompt this thing with PAC6, which is a, uh, supposed to be the master eye gene. And yes, if you, if you misexpress PAC6, this up here is the only region that can make ectopic eyes. But that's the wrong prompt. If you use a bioelectric prompt, you find out that actually any region in the embryo is competent to make eye. So this reminds us of something important in the field of diverse intelligence is that when we talk about the competency of various systems, we're really taking an IQ test ourselves. All we're really saying is this is what, this is what we know so far as far as what the system can do. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the limitation of what the system can do because maybe we have not found the right set of um, triggers or do not appreciate its, its behavioral repertoire. And the last thing uh, that, that was, is, I, I find uh, amazing about this is that uh, this is, so, so this, this is a lens sitting out in the flank of a, of a tail, of a tadpole somewhere in the tail. And what you'll notice, the blue cells are the ones that we injected with our potassium channel. All of these other cells up here were never injected. So what's happening here is that there's not enough of these cells to actually build an entire eye. So what they're doing is recruiting their neighbors to help them complete the process, right? That competency, we didn't have to put that in. The ability of these cells to do a secondary instruction. So we tell you make an eye and they tell their neighbors, you have to help us make an eye is something that we see in other collective intelligences like ants and termites. When they, where, they, where the colony scales its uh, efforts appropriate to a task of you know, carrying a large uh, food items and so on. So, so this, is, this is all part of what the, what the material can do. And of course, um, we're pushing this now into uh, uh, kind of biomedical areas. 
Uh, for example, frogs who normally do not regenerate their legs at this stage, normally um, uh, they, they, there's, there's, no, there's no repair. We have uh, figured out some bioelectrical um, uh, prompts that set the tissue to a particular state that says, go down the leg regeneration uh, a path, not the scarring path. And so immediately um, the pro-regenerative genes turn on and then uh, eventually you get this nice leg that's um, touch sensitive and motile. In the early stages, it looks like this, but a pretty, pretty respectable leg. And the idea is that we don't micromanage this. We're not talking to the individual cells, right? Any more than you're, you're talking to individual neurons when you're using high level behavioral um, control in, in animals. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's a very high level subroutine call where you can say, build a leg. That process takes 24 hours and the leg itself grows for a year and a half. You get 18 months. It's it's completely autonomous once you've once you've uh, convinced those cells that that's what they're doing as opposed to a um, a scar. It it goes. So uh, I, at this point, I have to do a disclosure. So Morphoceuticals Inc. is a company that um, Dave Kaplan and I founded to uh, try to do this in mammals and hopefully eventually um, human patients. Um, I want to show you one other uh, one other example uh, of uh, of an animal that uh, really lets us see. Uh, how how much uh, we can we can import from um, from from ideas in, uh, in in neuroscience? This is a planarian. These are flatworms that regenerate. Uh, they have some amazing properties that we don't have time to talk about now. But they're highly regenerative. Uh, they're also cancer resistant. They're immortal. They have no uh, no aging, um, and they're extremely resistant to transgenesis. And I think that's because of their incredibly noisy genome. If anybody's interested in that, um, uh, we can talk about that. But one of the amazing things is that when you cut it into pieces and the record is like 276 pieces or something like that, each piece gives rise to a perfectly normal worm and it has the right number of heads and tails. So we wondered how does a piece know how many heads and tails it's supposed to have? What control is that? And we discovered an electric circuit that determines this process. And what happens here is that um, you have, you have a normal worm uh, here. You've got the head and the tail. We amputate those. We take the middle fragment. Uh, and reliably, it makes a one-headed worm. About 100% of the time, it makes a one-headed worm. Uh, here's what the bioelectrical pattern is. If you read this, this, uh, this, this fragment here, it's got this pattern that, that we've been able to decode. This is one head, uh, one tail. And what we can do is we can take this animal and uh, change that pattern to, say, two heads. Okay, it's, it's kind of messy because the technology is still in its infancy, but we can, we can, we can make it to, say two heads and then this is what they built. Now here's the really critical part. This bioelectrical map is not a map of this two headed animal. Okay, this is really important. This, this bioelectrical map is a map of this perfectly normal one headed worm. This map, uh, when I, when I uh, said earlier on that there's a homo homeostatic process that has a store set point as a kind of uh, uh, beacon for the navigation and anatomical space. What you're looking at here is literally, we can now see the pattern memories, right? So we can actually visualize what does this tissue think that a correct planarian looks like? This is what it thinks it looks like, but it doesn't match the current anatomy and that's fine. Nothing changes until this animal gets injured. Then this pattern is consulted and the cells build a two-headed animal. So what this is, is not only is it a pattern memory uh, that, uh, that serves as the, as the set point, uh, but it is actually a counterfactual memory. It is a very primitive example of a kind of mental time travel where uh, we're used to brains being able to do this amazing thing where they, they can remember things that aren't true right now. They can uh, anticipate things that also aren't true right now. This, this state of affairs is not true right now. For this animal, the anatomy is normal, the gene expression is normal, but this is what it uh, stores as what am I going to do if I get injured in the future at some point. So, so we now know that the body of a planarian can store at least two, no, no doubt more, but we've nailed down two, two representations of what the target pattern is going to be if it should happen to be injured in the future. Now, another reason I call this thing a pattern memory is this, this remarkable result, which is that if you, uh, if you make a two-headed worm, and then you cut them again in plain water, they continue to regenerate two -headed, uh, in a two-headed way. There is no genetic change here. We're not touching the genome. We're not reprogramming uh, the, at the genetic level. We have, we have altered through a physiological experience the set point that guides the movement of the regenerative process in, 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 the, in their navigation of space. And it will continue to, uh, that, that electrical circuit holds as long as, as long as we don't set it back and we now know how to set it back, it will continue to hold. So this, this system has all the properties of memory. Now, not in physical space, in anatomical space. It's long-term stable, but it's rewritable. 
It has a conditional recall, which I just showed you a moment ago. It's got discrete possible behaviors, so one head versus two. Um, the individual cells aren't doing discrete things. It's the group, the collective, right? The, the, the individual cells here aren't confused as to whether there should be part of a head or a tail. The collective makes a decision about where it's going to go. Not only... Uh, not only can you uh, can you um, convince this the system uh, to to uh, permanently uh, take up a different set point for, for the number of heads, you can do the same thing for the type of heads, and you can make them have heads of other species. So, for example, here's a nice triangular headed Dugesia doradocephala. If we cut that head off and manipulate the um, the bioelectrical uh, uh, network, you can they they will make heads of flat heads like this P. felina. They will make round heads like this S. mediterranea. And they will happily, that same hardware, that same genomically determined hardware will visit the attractors in anatomical space where normally these other system, these other species hang out. About 100 to 150 million year distance here, no genetic change. And the same thing is, um, is uh, uh, true of uh, their uh, stem cell distribution, their brain shape. They can adopt the brain shape and the stem cells of these other species. Uh, the behavior we're still uh, we're still trying to nail down whether that's true. So the last uh, the last piece of this uh, I want to show you before we stop is is this what happens when when this this I, this cognitive glue fails? I've been I've been arguing that much like in the brain, these these electrical networks provide an essential connectivity that allows groups of cells to store memories and to pursue uh, error minimization with respect to those memories um, about goals in other spaces that the individual cells do not worry about. So, so, we're not, so, so the, the tiny little homeostatic goals of, of this cell, which basically are just the scale of the cell itself, and they're sort of you know, metabolic goals and things like that, uh, what evolution and development do is they scale up and give us electrical and chemical uh, uh, networks that can have very grandiose goals. They can maintain things like this, where if you deviate away from this, uh, then they will work really hard to get back and then they stop and, and, and relax. So, um, so, so what happens here is the scaling. I, in, in my framework, I call this the cognitive light cone for various reasons that we could get into, but the size of the, of the set points towards which the system can competently work is, is greatly scaled up from here to here. Now, now these electrical uh, processes can fail. And one thing that happens when cells become isolated from the rest of the network is they can no longer uh, uh, maintain uh, participation in this, in this pattern. Um, this is a, a human glioblastoma. And what happens here is that these cells are once they disconnect from the network, they roll back to their ancient unicellular self. Their goals are now extremely small. It's what is it? It's it, they're, they're to get as much uh, nutrients as they can and to proliferate as much as they can and to go wherever they want. As far as they're concerned, the rest of the animal is just external environment. So these cells are not more selfish. It's that their selves are smaller. What's happening here is that it's kind of a dissociative identity disorder, as certainly as, as seen in conventional cognitive systems, such as you know human human minds. Uh, we can have that here too. This system can break up so that the individual cells are pursuing uh, their own agendas, no longer this this kind of a collective thing that was working so well before. So that leads that kind of re that's that that really um, a different way of thinking about cancer, not as a genetic disorder of a broken uh, genome and so on. But as a as a as a failure of uh, of maintaining the properly sized boundary between self and world, so the scaling of that where do I end and the outside world begins, um, by thinking about it in this weird way, that suggests a very uh, specific therapeutic that once you have this kind of uh, there's an oncogene here, the first thing these cells do when the oncogene is expressed is they. Um, depolarize and, and cut electrical connections with their neighbors. At that point, they can no longer remember what they're supposed to be building. And, and that's it. You know, then you get metastasis. So um, one thing you might do here is say, okay, instead of toxic chemotherapy, we're not going to try to kill these cells. Uh, what we're going to do is force them to reconnect back to their neighbors. So when I inject this oncogene, and these are, these are nasty human oncogenes like KRAS mutations and so on, what you can also do is co-inject an ion channel that keeps the cell uh, in tight electrical connection with their neighbors, right? So it, it, it hyperpolarizes it so the gap junctions can form. So, so this is the same animal. Here's the oncoprotein. It's blazingly strongly expressed. In fact, it's all over the place. There's no tumor. And there's no tumor because it isn't the hardware that drives. It isn't the genetic state that, that drives this, much like in, 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 the, in the neuroscience where, where you know, the same hardware can do many different, uh, different behaviors, right? Depending on the, the local physiology. That's what's happening here is that these cells are connected to their neighbor, and now the whole network is busy uh, minimizing d delta from uh, having nice skin, nice uh, you know liver, and then all all those kinds of things. 
And so this, again, this also, we're now moving into, moving into humans. So, so the final, you know, my final point is that uh, when we're talking about bio, biomedicine, where, where the rubber hits the road with these, with these um, discussions of intelligence and can we, is that a category error to think about intelligence in non-brainy systems? To me, as, a, as an engineer, I, I judge all of this by how much utility you can squeeze out of it. And if we can use um, the tools of, of behavioral and neuroscience to achieve new capabilities and uh, in, in regenerative medicine and cancer and whatever, then, um, then, then I think we're onto something. And that means that uh, if we take seriously the idea that, that the body has a multi-scale architecture where the different pieces have different competencies on the scale, that means that we have lots of new kinds of approaches. And I'm just going to show you one real quick one. Um, this is, uh, if, you, if you look at this thing, you might ask, what, what, what is this? And you might think that this is a, a, pro, a, a primitive organism that I got out of the bottom of a pond somewhere. And I can tell you that if you were to sequence the genome of this little guy, what you would see is homo sapiens. This is 100% homo sapiens genome. What this is, is, uh, is a, uh, something we call an anthrobot. It's made of uh, cells collected from adult human patients, so actually tracheal epithelium that uh, people donate. And under a, a certain protocol that we have, these cells self-assemble, so there, there is no new genetic, uh, genetic material, no transgenes, no weird nanomaterials, no scaffolds. These cells uh, automatically assemble into this self-motile little, um, little structure, which has all kinds of interesting behaviors. Here's one. Uh, if you plate human neurons here uh, on, this, on this dish, and then you make a scratch, so a wound through this uh, neural layer, um, here, here it is. So, this, so these, these anthrobots you know, sort of um, uh, traverse it, and then... If you, uh, if you allow them to accumulate in a particular area across this neural scar, what you'll see is that they spend about four days knitting the sides together. When you lift it up, there's, there's, there's what it's doing. So who would have known that your tracheal cells, which normally sit there for decades quietly um, in, your, in your airway, are actually capable of uh, having a, a, a kind of a novel uh, existence in the self-motile form with new competencies. We would have never known that this is something that they can do. That we, nobody would have known that they can uh, heal neural, uh, neural defects if we hadn't uh, tested their various, uh, pl the plasticity of these cells. What are they willing to do? Um, what do they know how to do? This is just experiment one, you know, who knows what else. So the bottom line here is that uh, for biomedicine, uh, the molecular uh, approach of uh, always going down, downwards in terms of uh, descriptive models and, uh, and the concepts that we're using gives rise to all of these techniques. But being able to uh, look at uh, the things that neuroscience is very good at, which is multi-scale uh, kinds of interventions, uh, as in, you know, for, has been uh, known for, 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 for many, many years, that you can look at the scale of, um, of the synapses, but you can, and molecular protein, the proteins in the synapse, but you can also look at circuits and, uh, and, and you know, group dynamics and all of these other scales. All of this now is on the table. And we've done a lot of work um, here about things that I've not shown you about about this idea of really targeting, I mean, we've done cell training and things like that, really targeting these competencies uh, by taking seriously the idea that intelligence is not something you can guess, but you have to discover. And for that reason, I think that future um, uh, medicine is going to look a lot more like a kind of uh, somatic psychiatry than it's going to look like the chemistry of today. So I'm going to stop here and just uh, say that I think it's important to consider that uh, intelligence can be uh, deployed in uh, and, and embodiment can be deployed in uh, many different spaces besides our familiar 3D space, that uh, there's an attractive target for biomedicine in the mechanisms that uh, bind uh, cells together towards goals in higher, uh, higher scale um, spaces. Bioelectricity is a key element of this. And I really think that um, the, the major, uh, the deep ideas of neuroscience are not about neurons at all, and they have to do with um, cross-scale uh, kinds of um, uh, dynamics, problem-solving dynamics that evolution exploits uh, uh, at, at, every, at every level of structure. Um, and so um, uh, that's it. Uh, if, if you're interested in any of these things, uh, there are lots of, uh, lots of papers on this where I go into, uh, into detail. I will thank the, uh, the, the postdocs and the students who did all this work, our many collaborators, our funders, uh, the companies, uh, three companies that fund our work, and uh, always the animals because they do all the hard work. So thank you so much, and I'll take any questions.